You're, Steve, you were totally ready for... Was the J-Doodle? Yes. The J-Doodle? Give us the J-Doodle. All right. I kind of worked with Wes on this J-Doodle. Is a little bit his son's suggestion, actually. The idea is um, video game characters in the Olympics. I don't say they have to be successful or anything like that, but how different video game characters would do in the Olympics. Steve, your more specific quest oh. <laughs> is Overwatch. Wes's son, Logan, wanted, uh, what's his name? Um, Junkrat. <laughs> Anyway, for the people who uh, are joining us, just to explain quickly what a J-Doodle is, when you join us, you get a J-Doodle. Steve has five minutes, unless he's entertaining me, and then we give him extra time. You guys have the entire Sketch and Scotch, which is give or take an hour. So uh, yeah, do a video game character in the Olympics, and what, what would their sport in the Olympics be? We also do something called squirm work, which Steve gives uh, homework at the end of uh, the Sketch and Scotch, and you have a whole week, and so you can turn in your squirm work anytime. Uh, how you, um, today, you turn in your squirm work by going to the Twitch chat and giving us a link. So you have to make it digital somehow. The new thing we're doing, starting to do that, is um, we're giving sketch bucks. We need a better name for that. People in the chat, give me a better name for our sketch bucks. But anyway, we give people sketch bucks for everything they turn in, so you can earn two sketch bucks per sketch and scotch by turning in squirm work or a uh, J-Doodle. And oh, uh, when you earn sketch bucks, you can buy gently loved prints. It means the TSA might have dinged a piece here or there. So does Wes play Overwatch or just his son? I don't know. And who else here plays Overwatch? Yeah, who plays Overwatch? Steve's been being a little obsessive about Overwatch recently. I want to be good at something. So Steve, how's your week been? My week's been good. I've uh, I've mostly been doing the fulfillment on my my Patreon. I know a few of you are already on there, so all the rewards are done. I'm just signing a gazillion tokens <laughs> oh, right now. Oh, is that five minutes already? I'm entertained. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Oh my gosh, the squirm works are looking awesome. Cat's BFF. Holy cow. <laughs> I love it. The best part of the squirm work for me <laughs> is how many better than mine ideas I see every week. People are uh, cheering on the Overwatch. Dion says he's playing it right now. He, <laughs> nice. He's a good multitasker. Um, I didn't finish my squirm work. I was working on it, but I didn't get, you know, the... See, I'm the opposite of Dan. Dan did the whole apocalyptic landscape. I just did the cute creature in apocalyptic world part. So me and Dan can put our squirm works together and I'll have the cute creature and he'll have the apocalyptic landscape. So anyway, so is that just Junkrat winning all the prizes? He's the last man standing. Isn't that how Olympics work? <laughs> oh gosh, you're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> he got all the gold. Yes. And silver and bronze and and everything. Introduce us to what we're chatting about this week. Uh, so last time we started talking a little bit about uh, materials and surfaces and how to make different sorts of effects, surface effects, things oh, like that. Sorry. Oh, there's my, there's my extra five minutes Steve. anyway. So I thought today maybe we would do a anatomy of surfaces. You just have to be extra complex by calling it anatomy, don't you? Well. I think it's important to to be able to pick apart all the little pieces of what you're looking at. And so I call it anatomy because, yeah, there are little rules of thumb where you can say, uh, if you're doing metal, it should have high contrast. And if you're doing fur, it should be f sort of soft and fuzzy. But that's not always true. And that's not getting to the to the root of what really makes a thing look like a thing. And you can only get so far on tricks. If you want something to look realistic, especially, you can't always use those, those quick fix tricks, but you can always rely on your own eyes and your brains and you can figure it out. Everybody remembers these from art school. I didn't go to art school, I know. I, I always say that, but I did have art classes in high school. So, I, I mean, I did do these in, in art classes. So we all remember the little 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 spheres that you had to draw, and they'd make you shade them. Yes, and you've done them a couple times on uh, Sketch and Scotch, even. Surfaces have their own properties, and then they interact with light from the environment. Those are the two 
big interactions that you have to know about. You've got light that does its thing, and then you've got however the surface reacts to it. We've got our, our fun little little wonky sphere here. In fact, let's make it a little make a little happy face guy. Happy little happy little devil guy. <laughs> the first and most basic uh, surface part is your your diffuse property, right? And that's just your basic uh, where the light hits or does not hit. You could also think of this as your your shadow side, your shadow line, and this is just light versus dark. Now it can be soft, it can be rough, but this is basically just separating um, a light side and a dark side. If a surface is very very rough, this will be a a smoother transition. Just defining that light dark line can add so much to a piece. The best place I've seen them really define like that cut on a light dark line, comic books. Yep, comic books and anime and anybody who says that there's there's no artistic value in those, just just give them a, a gentle little punch in the nose because they're wrong. <laughs> Steve, are you advocating violence? Just just gentle, just gentle, advocating gentle little education. Yeah, yeah, sometimes it's Tough love. They did it out of necessity, but they were still skilled artists putting it together. And so they said, well, we want to shade it, but we can't really do soft gradient shading and stuff like that. And so they just did a, what we call cell shading, where you just have one thing for the diffuse light color and one thing for the shadow color. That would be little bit number one, is you've got your, your diffuse color and your shadow side. If it's something very smooth and hard, this line will be smooth and hard. If it's something that is rough, well, you're going to have it break up along that, that shadow edge. That is a property of how rough the surface is. If we're looking at on a micro tiny scale, here's our light, here's this curve. It's like a cross section. If it's really, really smooth, then right here, light's going to stop hitting it. And it's just going to be, it's going to be dark on one side, it's going to be light on the other side. If this is bumpy, then each one of these little things is going to cast the tiniest, tiniest little shadow on the next thing. And so what you'll get is a very either rough or soft transition. You want to think of it like where is the light hitting versus where is the light not hitting. Don't at this point worry about, well, how, how soft do I make the gradient to go from dark to light? Where is it and where is it not? Just one step at a time. In any given surface, you're also gonna have additional light sources. Like, we'll have the bounce light, and this is where we get what we call core shadows. I don't actually really like that term as much because what it really is is it's two light sources. You have one shadow, and then you have another light source bouncing light back up. And so, yeah, you get this core. This is where it's darkest because neither light source is hitting it. But it's a it's a little bit of a misleading term. Next, you will have your highlights. They can be a little bit misleading because the way I was taught in high school art class was that's where you go from one side, gradient it down to the other side and make it a nice smooth transition. And that's totally wrong. You do get a little bit of a gradient as the angle of incidence of the light reflects less, but that's not highlights. Highlights are a specular reflection. They are the light directly reflecting off of something. Diffuse light is this thing's being lit up by a big light source. Highlights are you're actually looking at a reflection of the light source. It's bouncing straight back at you. Um, a highlight is going to respond mostly to the angle at which that light source is hitting. It is not a gradient unless the thing is really, 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 really bumpy and then you almost don't even see highlights. One thing that they will tell you to do in art school but not give you a reason for is highlights should be a different color than everything else because that makes them pop. That can definitely be true, but what it is is the highlight is a reflection of the light source. Say this guy is, is kind of a, a blue. If he's a little blue, but he's standing outside, well then his highlights can be kind of yellow because you're looking at a reflection of the sun. Yes, it works very well to have different colored highlights, but you should be aware of why. What's causing the highlight? Because that's gonna make it far more realistic. Think of it as, as tracing through things. You're not gonna get a highlight on anything that light source can't see. It becomes a temptation sometimes for people to just start highlighting everything. They just go, oh yeah, here, and we have a highlight on here. 
Yeah, every place that there's a turning surface, I'm going to highlight the crap out of it. If the light source doesn't hit it, there shouldn't be a highlight there. Something that uh, Ainberger pointed out, and I actually agree, it was a really hard exercise, but it helps with this idea and trying to understand it, is the black piece of paper with white chalk. Yeah, Ugh. that is a good one. Cause... It's so hard. We, we think, uh, take something white and add shadow, but that one's take something at the shadow and add highlights, and that really helps you understand how that all works. Now next up is reflectivity. Now this is like highlights, but it's more for the entire object. Now everything has some kind of reflectivity. However, when you're, when you're addressing it in, uh, in painting or in uh, 3D rendering or anything like that, you're only worried about something that is pretty reflective. Reflectivity is hard because it is very, very specific to the environment around it. If we were to have reflection on this guy here, it would be just this sort of tan color all around. We have to have an environment for him to reflect in. So let's say here we've got a little, little red ball. Give it a little bit of a horizon line. We'll pretend that there's a sun in the sky and that he's outside. So when you're doing reflections, you're trying to think of what, what part of this object is bouncing off to you, the viewer. So you only need it in certain places because it's only going to reflect in certain places. And depending on how hard the surface is, the reflection will also be hard. Things will, will block reflections as well. So if you have like a big, stick here you might get a little little reflection here but it's it's going to stop right at this red ball part of the reason i'm doing this one step at a time is because that's an easy way to construct something you first you figure out your diffuse then you figure out your highlights then you figure out your reflections you can do these things in one tiny steps and just build upon it and build upon it to make it a more and more complicated piece which is Referencing back to last week's topic, which was how to take something from sketch phase, phase to finish. Now we're going to talk about a property of highlights that we've mentioned on the show before. The Fresnel effect. <laughs> you just, Dan's right, you just want to use big words. Yep. The Fresnel effect is the property of reflection which states that the greater the angle of reflection, right? Here's our angle. Great big old angle the more will be reflected. The easiest example is if you are a nice person, he's just standing there, he's like throwing rocks, right? He's on a lake. If you look across a lake, you see a reflection of the mountains on the other side of the sunset or the sky or whatever, and it's a pretty clear reflection. Whereas if you look straight down at the water's surface, you don't see yourself like in cartoons. You see either muddy water or you see rocks. It's not very reflective when you look straight down at it, right? If this angle is shallow, then the reflection is also shallow. All of that out of the way, how do you apply that in a painting? If we're looking at our guy here, this right here is gonna be the least reflective. This right here is gonna be the most reflective of the environment around it. As we get near these edges, it's going to be reflecting a lot. It's going to be almost the same color as the background it's reflecting. A lot of times when we're working on a drawing, we want to keep these black lines because we work so hard making these black lines around our thing. If you're trying to paint realistically, those black lines are usually the opposite of what would happen in physical, physical reality. The edges of an object are usually, if, they're ref if, if it's a reflective object, are usually one of the brightest parts. When you're aware of how it works, it works its way into to your work. You don't have to be doing physics calculations and all that kind of stuff as you go. Last week you kind of hit on it a little, where you talked about how most texture doesn't really show up except for right in the changeover from highlight to Dark. Yes. The way, the way we see texture is you've got your light source coming in and cross section is you've got this little bumpy, bumpy thing. And again, it's here's a little shadow being cast. Here's a little shadow being cast. 
here's a little shadow being cast, and that's where you're gonna see the highlights. As it turns this way, eh, this is all kind of getting the same amount of light. And as you get this way, well, it's just all in shadow. So where you get the most texture is right along that edge where pieces are casting shadow on other pieces. That is what physical texture is. There is also, of course, um, patterns. There's just different colors on an object. But if you're talking about texture... That's hard to do. Ugh, patterns in fabric without making it look like... Ugh, so um, hard. Yeah, but one step at a time. You do the patterns after you've got everything else figured out and you kind of just put them on top. Say this guy's got some scrapes. Bakari's been taking notes again, so we keep distracting him from doing gay doodles, Steve. Actually, like, that's the biggest, like, compliment is when someone's like, I didn't do my gay doodle cuz... because I was learning. So if he's all scuffed up like this, we're mostly gonna see the effect of the scuffing right as he's changing from dark to light. And the second place you're gonna see a lot of uh, aggressive stuff is in these highlight areas. You're getting these tight little reflections on just tiny pieces. You wanna think of these as adjustments on what you've already got. Don't think, oh, well, there's gonna be scuff things for the highlights way out here. Uh, mm, no, it's not gonna to wander too far from its home. The texture is gonna go ahead and make a little bit of interesting stuff happen around your highlights. Some interesting stuff happen in other transitional areas. This, this is kind of a nice segue into another property that reflective things have, and in fact, a lot of things have to some degree or another, including human skin, which I know you guys are interested in getting to, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to some human skin. The reason it's so hard to render is it is a cornucopia of every effect, uh, including one we haven't covered, two we haven't covered yet. What we'll cover real quick is different sorts of highlights. This is a standard basic, just, it's just a highlight, right? Um, another interesting highlight is what is called anisotropic highlights. Is a type of highlight where the surface has regular markings, <laughs> uh, surface details. So what it is is a directionality of highlight and what it comes from is, it's like brushed metal. If you have brushed metal, then it's all got these scratches all in one direction. Or a Christmas ball has thread that all wraps around it in one direction. On a tiny, tiny scale, what is happening is you have these little tubes, they are all catching a highlight, and then you've just got one after another, after another, that are all catching that highlight. So once you zoom out, what actually happens is this whole surface gets a highlight that stays in one direction. On a cylinder, it doesn't make that big of a difference, but yeah, so if you go to a Christmas ball, one of the interesting things about Christmas balls is the highlights, they move in weird ways. They, the highlights themselves, they don't stay round for a round light source. The most practical example is hair. Hair is all these little tubes and they catch highlights and you get um, another thing you can learn from anime, you get bands of light, bands of highlights going across the surface of the hair. And so if you understand that's what's happening, you can put those light bands in the right place, you can have them shaped appropriately, uh, and you can make very much more realistic looking hair and, uh, and other surfaces. Human skin is also anisotropic. Not very much though, it's subtle. Humans, we have all of our, our fun little limbs, right? We got legs and all this, and if you zoom way, way, way in, we have all of our skin cells. They kind of hang with gravity, and so they become flat, right? And so if you're rendering this leg, it's gonna have a, a bit more of a band of light rather than just have like, oh, here's a highlight here and here's a highlight here. It's pretty subtle on, on human skin, but it's there. If you were doing hair, mm -hmm. what about Curly hair. Curly hair has the exact same property. It's just a little bit more intensive, right? So say you have like ringlets. We can still break this down very easily. All the hair is going this way, this is going that way, it's going this way, this way. Our highlights are still gonna make these, these lovely little bands going in the direction of the hair. Even something that uh, becomes complicated because it's really wavy hair that's going in all different crazy directions you can still 
the figure it out. The anisotropic highlights will actually really help to define curly hair. Mm -hmm. Anisotropic highlights apply to human skin and to faces and to all the other lovely bits that humans have. The other fun thing that we haven't talked about yet is something called subsurface scattering. This goes along with translucence. Translucence is the property of, of a surface that light can enter it a certain distance. It's not quite transparency. It doesn't go all the way through. It goes in and scatters around and comes back out. Translucence examples are if you're looking through a, a leaf that is being hit by sunlight, it's, it's lit in the back because the light comes all the way through. Now, subsurface scattering is a property of translucency that directly applies to humans. We are composed of many different layers. And our top layer is skin. And skin's kind of a, kind of a yellowy. You've seen it when it's not attached to people anymore. It's, it's kind of yellowy gross. Underneath the skin, we have blood. Yay, blood. And then under that we have bones and stuff and those block the light entirely. But what happens with people is you get the light coming in and it hits the skin and the skin is a little like wax. It scatters all around. Some of it gets all the way down to the blood and it scatters back out. That gives us skin color. It's, it's reddened up by the blood. And that's why people change color when they are flushed or when they are cold or any of these things that affect the blood underneath your skin, that's, that makes us change color. Some of that uh, you can just apply practically to anywhere and anyone. You can say, well, okay, rosy cheeks. We'll give this guy rosy cheeks. And that makes him softer and happier and more human. There's a principle that is taught in portraiture that says you have a band across the nose and the cheeks. It should be red. Everything should be redder across the nose and cheeks. And this, this part I feel is, is more or less practical because you have more capillaries and more stuff going on there. You do tend to have rosier cheeks and a rosier nose. Eyebrows and stuff, that should be yellow. It should be more yellow. And the idea is that there's less blood. Um, it's more just straight up skin. And then for some reason, blue down here. Now, the real reason is that if you're doing a male portraiture, that gives you the effect of a five o'clock shadow. It makes someone look masculine. But I have seen portrait artists who they have, they've heard that rule and they apply that rule, but they apply that rule to everyone and their women look like they have beards. The interesting part in this subsurface scattering is where you get a little bit of a discrepancy between the one and the two, right? So you get your skin, doo -doo -doo -doo, and you get your blood, doo -doo -doo -doo, and you get a light source. The light source here comes in, bounces out. Light source here comes in, bounces out. Light source here comes in, goes through. And some of it's scattering from here, from here, from here. Some of this light hits here, it scatters through here. This area changes color as it changes from light to shadow. It gets redder before it gets darker because some of that red is scattering through the shadow side of the skin. Let's make this guy a little bit more skin color. I will show you what I'm talking about. And he's gonna be a little bit weird because he's already look, he looks like metal. Here, he looks like he could be plastic or he could be, he could be clay at this point because we kind of soften the highlights a little bit. If the light's coming in and hitting here, a little bit is gonna scatter through here if this is skin. So what we're gonna get is about the same value as this, but we make it a little redder, make it a little saturated, and we just give it a little bit, a little Dad bit of warmth. suggests that next warmth. time you do an educational segment, bring in pieces you've completed to showcase how the lesson's applied to its fullest. But just adding um, a little bit of that, that little warm. Yeah, and adding that little tiny, it. and it's weird because it's green, so you'd expect the red to look really strange, and it still does on his cheek. <laughs> but, um, but right where you put it into that right edge shadow that looks awesome it really brings life to it that's the effect of a little bit of subsurface scatter is that it softens the uh the shadow edge and if it's skin it makes it all rosy like and this this can really um go, go ahead and try it in any piece that you've you've been like why does this person not look alive why do they look like a zombie all right, everyone, make sure, by the way, get your get your J-doodles in. While everybody's turning their stuff in, now we can do a really quick thing on compound surfaces. So say you've got this what? guy, 
and he's got skin, but he's <laughs> wet. Okay, right? How do you do wet skin? What's different about wet skin? Well, wet skin has a reflective layer on top of everything else. And so you only have to add that reflection -y bit. Essentially, you just add a reflective or a highlight layer on top of everything you've already done. This, this is how I paint. I do one step at a time. I figure out just one piece at a time. And once, once it's finished, it looks like this very complex procedure that would be, or not procedure, it, it looks like there's just so much going on that I must have, I must either have wizard witch black magic people working for me or somehow I've managed to take a picture of a gold dragon or or something like that it's it's not it's just working it one piece at a time have we got uh, we got stuff turned in yet yeah we do we've got some great stuff turned in I'm really excited to look through it all I am too Lord Ragnaros <laughs> fails at the Winter Olympics I yes I love I, oh, I do awesome. love Scott's this is Scott's J Doodle and why Lord Ragnaros <laughs> totally sucks at Winter Olympics. That's brilliant. Yes, Jamek. All right. What's she doing, Jamek? That's a character from his, um, he said he had a post-apocalyptic world. Oh, yeah. Uh, from his book, and so that's the character from his post-apocalyptic world. You can kind of see, like, this scarred landscape and everything. Yeah. So I really liked it. Yeah, very cool. For a minute I thought it was the uh, Olympics. I was like, what's, yeah, what, 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 what Olympic is this? Okay. Let's see. Yeah, that's what I was saying. We got, <laughs> can't cross. Don't cross the streams, Steve. No, I'm that was such a, a fool. Jamek's uh, squirm work of the post-apocalyptic world. With he 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 confessed his wasn't a cute character, but a, a, a creature. It's a creature. She's cute. cute. She's cute. <laughs> She's. I I think it works. So this is My Little Pony in a post-apocalyptic world. This is Cat's BFF. <laughs> Carrying around an alcohol bag. <laughs> To Maybe that's just for you, Steve. To revive just for, you. I, I, uh, I'm good with that. It, and, and I think she, like, everyone else's is great, I will admit. But I think she really captured the soul of the idea of a cute creature in a post-apocalyptic world. Yeah. It's, uh, and she's got, a, she's got a great purpose. She's bringing relief she's to the people who are doomed. <laughs> this is Janet's. Here we are, folks, the famous harbor spot where Nemo the brave plucky clownfish escaped the evil Dala. Uh, Asteroxo <laughs> corrected you. The alcohol's for the unicorn, not for anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I know a little unicorn is going to meet with an accident. Oh, I, I don't know. I've seen some pretty terrible, scary pictures of unicorns defending things. I think, I think it'll come out on top. Yeah, I, I've seen legends. They're mean. Yeah. Yes, I like that. A post apocalyptic red panda. I know, he's so That's sad. That's adorable. And and sad. I don't know why that would make me more sad. Oh gosh. Oh my goodness. Dollar just uh, linked us with a picture of a fat unicorn skewering a person. <laughs> oh. So try to take my alcohol, I'll tell you yeah. a thing or two. Well, I've I've been appropriately warned. <laughs> And Jay and this looks like Mr. Dan. J Doodles. We are just finishing up the squirm work. We're getting on to the J, J Doodles, Jay Mc. This looks like Dan's post apocalyptic world. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Very and I cool. up mine. mine uh, like I said, mine and Dan's post apocalyptic worlds go together. Oh. Because he forgot the cute creature and I forgot the landscape. So, um. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll put yours in his then. This is cats. And I will fully admit, I was complete. I was totally inspired by uh, last week's. Was it Squirm work? No, it was uh, J Doodle with the cute uh, zombie butler that with the adorable head, like little cute skull. I was trying to like copy that adorable cute skull on top oh, of that yeah. squirrel's head. There you go. I like it. <laughs> squirrel. Yay! Now Dan and I have <laughs> collaborated. Very nice. This is... So this is the beginning of the squirm work. This is, um, uh, Robin. Oh, I know this. It's a... He's in, um, the Smash Brothers, but he's also in, I asked earlier, Fire Emblem. 
Yeah, it's gonna. That, didn't you, yeah, Steve? no, I didn't. I didn't play it, but I know the character. I've I've done some alters. I think I did an alter of of this character for um, for Sir Robert. Very cool. He's a he's a tough he's one. A that's a power lifter. That's three hundred and some odd pounds. Those are forty five pound plates. They could be the hundred pound plates. That would be very scary. The, they look more like the actually they do. The width yeah, they on those, they look more yeah, like hundred pound plates. They do. That would be very heavy. And Bakari did, this is the most Bakari was able to do before he got distracted completely and started taking notes. <laughs> this is uh, a whole Olympic it's Overwatch thing Olympic. going on. I think you can see Roadhog. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Roadhog's much of a sprinter. Yeah, he, he's <laughs> lying on the ground. And uh, Farah back here doing the high jump. That yeah. seems like cheating, but okay. That's awesome. <laughs> Robert confirmed he did a female. You did a female Robin Lily, for yes. him. Yes. And Jamek says that might be the best idea for a Liliana he's ever heard. This is Dan's ratchet. Yep. Olympic sport shooting disqualified for blowing up the f half the field with one shot. Not awesome. Aiming so much. <laughs> he hit his target though. Dan says he got carried away with his J-Doodle. Good! Oh, it's awesome. We're happy to hear you get carried away. Then we have some uh, Mario Kart characters. Oh my gosh, well, yes. Peach is, is this competing in This is Cat's BFF, and I love how much thought she put in. And I like that she's doing like little individual sketches. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this one, and this one, and this one. Makes me happy. Awesome. Peach does swimming, Rosalinda does equestrian, Mario does long jump, and Bowser hurdles. Or maybe just sleeping. That was, that was, that was made me laugh. <laughs> and Luigi was disqualified for doping because Mario knew he would lose to him and put something in his juice. Oh gosh. <laughs> I like it. I love how much thought she puts into the into her um, J Doodles and uh, and Squirm work. It makes me laugh. We have the King of Katamari. Yes, this one is Asteroxo. <laughs> he's a heck of a goalie. This, yes. uh, <laughs> uh, he's going to be an amazing goalie. Wow. <laughs> good show, good show. Nothing's getting past that. That he's... was uh, Dollar's, Dollar's little one. Little Dollar. Oh, he's super cute. Yeah. Dollar said he stole his little, his little uh, stylus to do it. <laughs> So did you do it on like a, an iPad or a Surface or something like that? I think he said it was like an that? iPad. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I like them Got all. Got a little I artist like... on your hands. Sometimes theft is good. Keep them away from dressers. <laughs> yep. And lots details. and lots of clever stuff this week, guys. Thank you. Thank you for arting with us, guys. We super appreciate it. I love seeing what people, like Steve was saying, I love seeing other people's... Um, point of views and how they take a topic. You give people this theme, not too much specifics, and they come up with just amazing, awesome stuff. It makes me so happy. Um, thank you for being here, everyone. We do this to hang out with you guys, and we want you to have fun and, and get, we wanna know what you want to get out of it. So let us know what, what you like to see, and we'll do more of that. Next week's Valentine's Day, we should do Valentine's Day. All right. We good. should do Valentine's. Okay, good call, good call. I am okay with you re retracting your... We'll save the propaganda posters for another time, but since we have a holiday next week, we'll have, uh, we'll have Valentine's stories. Hopefully no trips to the emergency room. <laughs> and we'll do a Valentine's sketch. Is it just that, that you a want to do... A Valentine's card or a Valentine's... Valentine's card? All right. Uh, or... You know, a, a Valentine's topic, you know, some some romantic theme, something cute. And is there an art, uh, if they want to, is there an art topic you want them to focus on? Valentines usually have characters involved, so I guess uh, expressiveness in your characters. Okay. Try and show what they're feeling, whether that is that they're thrilled to be getting a valentine or they're in love or they're repulsed by the entire concept whatever you want to do just kind of focus on that expression the uh so valentine's with the uh, focus on expressions next week that's good thanks for joining us everybody come back next week wednesday
and uh, regale us with ribald tales of your Valentine's exploits. Yep. And make sure to follow, like, love, and everything. Tell all your friends to come and watch. All right. Ta-ta for now. Don't forget to be awesome. <laughs>